On today's episode of Biblical Genetics, the octopus is from Mars, and other stories. I'm going to summarize for you four things and how they fit with creation very, very, very well. The first is about octopuses and what they do to their DNA. Now, we already had hints of this from squid, but it turns out the octopus is a squid on steroids. Several episodes ago, I talked about a phenomenon that I called splicing and dicing the human genome. That is the process that we go through to produce the proteins that our body makes. The thing is, we only have about 22 to 23,000 protein coding genes, and we make more than 300,000 different proteins. And we do that by taking the protein coding genes, cutting sections out, and sticking them into other protein coding genes. And this is gigantic interaction network of all these different pieces of a gene to the point where we don't even have the definition of the word gene anymore. But some of our genes, a couple of hundred, go through another process called RNA modification or RNA editing. So after the RNA is made, and this can be made into a protein, sometimes a couple of letters on that RNA might be changed. Maybe an A changes to a G or something like that. And that changes the amino acid in the final protein. That's really interesting, but it only happens to a limited extent. In the Nautilus, maybe a thousand RNAs are modified. In the squid, maybe about 57,000. But in the octopus, about 130,000 different edits occur in different places on different RNAs, on different genes of the octopus. This is complicated and crazy and really, really, really hard to explain in an evolutionary context because octopuses go way back in the fossil record. This had to happen before octopuses so-called evolved. But not only that, I mean, think about if you had a, a, an instruction set, maybe it's the instructions for making chocolate chip cookies or maybe for building a, a new Tesla Roadster. Something that you have is a sheet of instructions that says do this and this and this and this to make something. What would happen if you randomly change your instructions? Well, more than likely, they're gonna mess something up. Occasionally, you might actually do something beneficial, but everyone knows, the evolutionists and the creationists together know that most random changes are bad. The amount of changes that must have occurred in the octopus is extreme. Now, I want to be careful here because I don't want to fall into something called an argument from incredulity. That's a logical fallacy, as in, I don't believe it, or I can't imagine it, or oh, no way, that's not true, that's not possible. That's not a good argument. However, incredulity does drive science. We use it all the time. A scientist says, you know, I don't think that can possibly be true. I'm going to go disprove it. Or this is something I can exclude easily because it, it just doesn't fit rational discussion. So incredulity is a part of science, and here we have a problem of math. Because the number of evolutionary experiments that must have occurred to produce this incredibly complex system in the octopus is extreme. And every single one of those changes would have had to have been selected, and most changes would be bad. So in order to get 130,000 changes, how many millions of experiments had to happen? And there's not enough time in evolutionary history for that number of experiments to happen in the octopus lineage. Second news story from this week was a hybridization between two fish species that have been supposedly separated for 184 million years. Whoa. We're talking about the paddlefish and the sturgeon. Two very different animals in one sense, and yet they have some similarities, but scientists were using um, the sperm of one species to try to stimulate development of eggs in another species. There's a very strange phenomenon that happens in um, several fish species it's called gynogenesis. That is, an egg, if it's stimulated with sperm, the, the DNA from the sperm doesn't get into the egg, but the egg will start to parthenogenically develop and it will always become a female fish. There are some species of fish that do this, and it's really interesting, but it usually takes sperm from a contributing father, even if he doesn't contribute any DNA. So in order to try to help um, these very endangered fish, some scientists in Hungary took the sperm from one species and used it to fake fertilize the eggs from another, and they started to develop but then they realized they started to develop because they got DNA from the father, from the other species. 
And not only did it develop, but they had a high rate of survival. Many of these fish are still alive today, and they're intermediate between a sturgeon and a paddlefish. And they gave them the whimsical name, Sturtlefish. I love this. This is amazing, exciting, fascinating. I mean, what is going on here? I love it when science throws us curveballs like that. Because on the one hand, in the evolutionary sense, these fish should not be able to hybridize anymore, period. In the creation sense, we don't expect them to be able to hybridize because if they're that different, they might not be able to anymore if they were the original same created kind. If they're different created kinds, we wouldn't expect them to hybridize at all. And yet here it's happening right before our very eyes. So I expect that the sturgeon and the paddlefish are one created kind. Except there's something we don't know yet. We do not yet know if the offspring are themselves fertile. A lot of crosses between a lot of species produce sterile offspring. The classic example is the mule, but mules aren't always sterile. Occasionally, a female mule can breed with a donkey and produce offspring. In the same way, um, a bottlenose dolphin and the false killer whale, we know, even though they're different species, they can hybridize and produce offspring. And those offspring have hybridized with dolphins again. In fact, there's an animal swimming around the Waikiki Aquarium today that's three-quarter bottlenose dolphin and one-quarter false killer whale. Definitely the same created kind. But in the paddlefish and the sturgeon, we're talking about two completely different families. At least taxonomists have given the rank of different families. And here we have hybridization between them. This raises huge questions about what a genus and a species and a family is. It raises huge questions about taxonomy and it raises gigantic questions about evolution because these things should not be able to hybridize, even to produce sterile offspring. Mules come from horses and donkeys and horses and donkeys are very similar to one another. Third huge news story from this week. You might have heard of Thor Heyerdahl or seen the movie Kantiki or read the book Kantiki. Now, Thor Heyerdahl was a, um, an explorer right after World War II and he concluded that the Pacific Islands could have been settled from South America. Therefore, Native Americans could have sailed across the ocean and settled the Pacific Islands. Interesting. And then he got in a, in a boat he made himself. And sure enough, he and his crew floated across the ocean a long, long way, more than a thousand miles, and got to one of the islands, showing that it could have been done. But from the linguistics, we know this is not true. If you look at the language family spoken across Polynesia, it traces back to Taiwan. In the highlands of Taiwan, there are 10 different languages in this language family. One of those languages is spoken from ancient Formosa across the Pacific Ocean. So linguistically, they go back to Formosa or Taiwan. Genetically, they also go back to Taiwan. There has been a few waves of people moving across the Pacific. First one was, um, well, at least the one that got the furthest was the Polynesians. But behind them came the Melanesians, a different group of people. They look different. They have very different languages. They came from the, the southeast, uh, just north of Australia. Those islands there, Fiji and places like that. And they spread eastward also across the islands, but mostly males. So we can see the genetics of these people. But the big news is this. It's always been a mystery. If they got so far across the Pacific, could they have discovered South America? Well, that's a whole different animal because South America is really far away from the last islands. This is uh, the Line Islands, Marquesas, even Rapa Nui or Easter Island. They are a long way west of the west coast of South America. In fact, the greatest biogeographic barrier on Earth is about 1,500 miles of open water between those islands and the coast of the Americas. Anyone who's flown from Los Angeles to New Zealand and has been foolish enough to get a window seat has discovered this. That is the most boring flight on earth because it flies over nothing. There's no islands, there's no boats, there's nothing to see except water and sky all day and all night. How do I know this? Because I've done it a couple of times and the second time I did it, I went ahead and got an aisle seat because I love sitting next to the window. I love looking out. I've seen a Grand Canyon. I've seen Japan at night. I've seen, I've flown over Borneo, which is now called Kali Mountain. There's amazing things to see in this world. And I love flying for one of those reasons. But that flight down the Pacific Ocean to New Zealand from LA, it, it is extremely boring because there's nothing out the window. So here we have the Polynesians. Did they make that jump? Now, all the other island hopping that they did, 
they could sense where islands were. They could look for birds. They could look for um, plankton in the water, wave patterns, because as waves uh, hit an island and bounce off or they diffract around an island, they'd set up wave patterns that they could read. They would look for clouds because the high islands usually have a cloud top and you can see those clouds from a long, 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 long way away. And you can see lightning even further at night. So they navigated using the most amazing, brilliant uh, techniques that mankind has ever seen. But then they hit those last islands. And now we see evidence of Native American DNA from South America in the Columbia area popping up in little pieces way to the west in some of those islands. And it looks like it happened before the Polynesians settled Rapa Nui or Easter Island. Cool. So it really does look like Christopher Columbus was maybe 600 to 1,000 years late. The Polynesians discovered for themselves the Americas. Now, I'm not trying to be uh, racist or bigoted. I know Christopher Columbus has got a bad reputation today, and I know that Europeans did not discover something that people had already discovered. But Christopher Columbus at least discovered the Americas from the perspective of the Europeans. But it looks like the Polynesians discovered the Americas from the perspective of the Polynesians, and they took captives or had children or brides or something because somehow the DNA of the Native Americans got out into the Pacific Ocean. The fourth big news story from just this week is based on an idea called hemizygosity. Now I'm going to get to how, why this is so exciting in a second. Let me explain what that means. Hemizygosity. You are heterozygous. Heterozygosity is in the human genome. That hetero means different. So you can have a gene from your mother is different from your gene from your father. That's hetero, different. Hemi is like a hemisphere. A hemisphere is only a half of a sphere. Well, to be hemizygous means you only have one copy of that gene. The other portion is not there. In an amazing case of serendipity, a creationist published a paper on hemizygosity. At the same time, an evolutionist presented a paper on hemizygosity. In the Journal of Creation, Per Turborg, uh, published a paper called the Hemizygosity Hypothesis. He suggested this. He said, what if God front-loaded his creation with a lot of hemizygous traits? So an individual can get this giant chunk of DNA or not. And if that chunk of DNA carries things that affect the behavior or the look of the individual, you can get a lot of changes really quickly. And he said, this is a really good mechanism that he thought would produce a lot of variation very quickly. He was using plants as an example. Because in some plants, they have a long pistol, a short stamen, or a long stamen and a short pistol, and it's all based on genetics, and it turns out there are these big chunk of genes that are there or not, and that affects how the plant looks. Cool. So, some other scientists were studying sunflowers, and they, they sequenced the genomes of multiple individuals in several different species of sunflowers. And what they found was amazing. They found gigantic chunks. In fact, they found 37 huge haplotypes. Another big word, haplotype. That's just a chunk of DNA. You have haplotypes in your body. You got pieces of DNA from mom and pieces from your father. But in this case, the haplotypes are gigantic, between 1 million and 100 million base pairs. That's longer than several human chromosomes. So you can have a sunflower that can have this little piece of DNA or this big piece of DNA or two little pieces of DNA or two big pieces of DNA. And within that, that long portion are a lot of different genes that affects the individual. And so within the same species, you can have two sunflowers. One might be living on sand dunes and it might flower two months earlier than a, a, a same species of a sunflower that's blooming in a swampy area. Wow. So what we have here is a front-loaded mechanism to produce lots of variation instantly. There's no evolution here. There's no natural selection necessary. Now, natural selection might happen in the sunflowers living on the sand dune. Great, because only the ones that flower early might get the water. If it gets real hot in the summertime and dries out, they won't be able to flower late. But my point is this. 
Creationism predicts a lot of change. A whole lot of change. Why? Because our God, the brilliant designer, placed into his creation the ability to change. Now, Charles Darwin looked at that and he said, Oh, if I extrapolate over millions of years, I can say that I see no limit to the amount of change. I want to refer you to an article that I wrote. I called it How to Think, Not What to Think. And in that article, I provided... Um, a way to separate and understand evolution and creation. But what I said was that we're both claiming a lot of the same territory. Both theories make predictions that overlap a lot. So evolution says change over time. So does creation. Evolution says natural selection. So does creation. In fact, the arguments that Charles Darwin made all the examples that he used fit beautifully within creationism, except when he was extrapolating. So Darwin said things like, start with a light sensitive spot. And all you have to do is get a cup to form and a lens to grow. And he thought he could explain the evolution of the eye. But he started with a miracle. The detection of light and the conversion of a photon, which is like, you know, catching a bullet. Photons destroy biological molecules. The ability to grab a photon in a biological molecule and convert that into a nerve signal, send it to a brain and have the brain be able to respond to that nerve signal is one of the most unbelievably cool and unpredictable ideas in evolutionary theory. It works beautifully in a design aspect again because of the complexity of the situation and that the fact that this is not something that should ever happen by itself. So he says start with a miracle and then you can get things to change. So point is this. Evolution and creation argue over a lot of the same territory. And yet, evolution is more of a, um, a, a bottom-up argument. We can see little changes, fine. And then Darwin extrapolates to infinity. But if you go in the other direction, from the top down, and you see the radical revisions that have to happen in life, if you see the utterly improbable and unpredictable ways that chemistry happens in biology, you're going to become a creationist. So Christians, if you are struggling with the concept of evolution and it's it maybe eating at your faith, I want to encourage you that we don't have to roll over and play dead every time an evolutionist comes and says something. Every new discovery, in fact, most of their discoveries fit beautifully within the creation mindset. It fits beautifully within the creation model. Most everything in science is perfectly fine for us. Where I differ is when an evolutionist will extrapolate beyond the data. Because evolution is a paradigm. It's a worldview. It's a philosophy. It's this overarching thing that tries to explain everything that it can see. But it can't really explain anything. Because the things it claims to explain easily are the things that fit within creation easily also. And the things it has a hard time explaining are things that show that evolution actually is not true.